Why can you never speak another language fluently? This is the University of the Netherlands. Do you think it helps if I speak to her in her mother tongue? Do you think a baby understands her mother tongue? No, of course. Well, it depends. But a young baby, a baby, a neonate, just born, do they understand their native tongue? No, they don't speak anything. They don't understand anything. Do they recognize their mother tongue? Yes. If they're 10 hours old, and we know this only for children of 10 hours old, not younger, because unfortunately we cannot do any experiments with younger children. <laughs> but if they're 10 hours old and they hear their mother tongue, they know that this is their language. We know this because we can do small experiments with children this young, because babies can do two things. They can suck or they can fall asleep. That's two things, but that's enough for an experiment. Right? And now we know we bring in some person who speaks the, the literal mother tongue, so the language of the mother, and also some other language which we know the mother has never heard, so the baby has also never heard when it's just born. And this person tells a story in one language or the other. Now it turns out that the child listens more intensely and longer when this person speaks the mother tongue. So the, the baby just born, 10 hours old, recognizes the mother tongue. Well, has the baby learned this in these first few hours? No. It has learned it before. It has probably learned it already in the womb. It has, in, the in, he, in here, you can hear things. You cannot hear it very clearly. You cannot recognize words because you cannot hear vowels and consonants. So you hear everything a little bit like that, right? So it's, there's this, well, not maybe, this, well. <laughs> Let's not go into that. Um, but there is this flesh and liquid surrounding you, and that's how you hear it. These children don't understand the language. They don't know any words. But what they know, what they recognize, is the thing they can hear. And that's the rhythm of the language, and maybe also a little bit of the intonation, but mostly the rhythm, the, the way in which this language was spoken. And we know this because you can, of course, also take this person and then who spoke these two languages and then manipulate his voice by computer such that you can only do this, and then still the baby can recognize it. As a matter of fact, this is what we do sometimes as well. If you, you're in a hotel room, and there's a couple next door, and they speak some language. And it's next door, so you cannot really understand it. But still, sometimes you can hear what language they speak. You can recognize the language even though you don't understand it. That's the same trick we applied when we were very young. Why is that? So why do we learn so early with recognizing this mother tongue? Well, the mother tongue is obviously going to be very important, because that's the language from which everything will have to grow. Almost everything, right? Almost everything else you're going to learn in your life is going to come through you in your mother tongue. You're going to connect to people around you. And we humans, we are nothing without this connection. So this rhythm, somehow we're driven before we're born to start learning what we can about that language about that mother tongue, because we cannot start early enough. That means this rhythm is going to be very deeply entrenched in us. And that's at least part of the answer why it's going to be so difficult to ever learn to speak a different language with a different kind of rhythm. Why rhythm? What does this rhythm do? Well, here's an idea. Most language comes to you in a spoken form, obviously. It's something you listen to, it's something you hear, so your brain has to somehow compute what's going on. That goes very fast, right? So you, the sound touches your ear, within a quarter of a second, you understand what the other person says, typically. Within a quarter of a second, so very fast. 
A lot of this happens here in the auditory cortex because it's first listening, it's recognizing this is language. Now, the auditory cortex has neural oscillations, has a certain kind of pulse, it moves in a certain kind of rhythm. We also know the brains of two people have more or less the same kind of pulse. They communicate more easily. So by transmitting a certain kind of rhythm, you can try to bring the other person in this same pulse. This is what I'm trying to do now. That's what you always try to do when you communicate. You try to get people to think literally on the same wavelength. And this pulse, so there is some variation, there's some individual variation. Right? So it can be a little bit shorter, it can be a little bit longer. And as a matter of fact, there are three types of languages, rhythmic types of languages we have discovered. That's an old discovery. It was made about 100 years ago, at least for the first two, which are typical for European languages. The first one really takes syllables. Every syllable is exactly as long. Every syllable, you speak every syllable the same length. Those are called machine gun languages. Ta -ta 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 -ta. That's French. That's Italian. That's Spanish. Romance languages in Europe are typical examples of that. When I tried to do it now in English, it sounded kind of unnatural. That's because English is not that kind of language. In English, not every syllable is the same length. What has the same length is the distance between two stressed syllables. When I say in French, marcher dans le bois, every syllable has the same length, marcher dans le bois. When I say the same thing in English, I say walking in the woods, walking in the woods. So the distance between walking in the woods, those are, those are the real distances. Those languages are called Morse code languages. Morse code, ta 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 Unstressed syllables don't matter. What matters is only the stressed syllables. That's our second type of language. Now, afterwards, a third type was discovered, a third type which is actually widespread across the world. Uh, Arabic is an example of that, probably. At least classical Arabic is. Japanese is an example of that and also the classical European languages, Greek and maybe also Latin, were like that. They are called mora time. That's somewhat of a less inspiring word maybe than machine gun or Morse code. Moras are half syllables. A short syllable is one length, a long syllable is twice that length. So you say da, m, m. Right, so it's twice the length of a short syllable. When you say this phrase in Japanese, I cannot do that, unfortunately, but we do have sound. Moi wo tori, tori. That's twice as long as a short uh, syllable. I cannot say it, I cannot hear it. Just like I am a speaker of Dutch. Dutch, like English, is a Morse code language. I have a hard time really hearing the rhythm of machine gun languages as well. It's just difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult to hear. It's also, in particular, difficult to feel. Still, the rhythm is of your native language is inside us. And when we start looking, we find it everywhere. Everywhere where we engage in rhythmic, any kind of rhythmic activity. We find it first in poetry. I've always been interested in a, a little small historical puzzle, mystery, something which happened in Renaissance times, here in Northern Europe, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Poets, English poets, Dutch poets, started writing Renaissance poems. Now, this Renaissance thing came from Southern Europe, 
came from Italy, came from France, came from languages which had this other rhythmic type. And their poetry was like that, St and still is. So French poetry, Italian poetry, every line has 10 syllables or 11 syllables or 12, some fixed number of syllables. These English poets and these Dutch poets, they tried to do the same thing. They tried to do it, and they failed. They failed immediately. They failed miserably. But in both places, here in Amsterdam and over there in London, they ended up with the same, exactly the same result, namely an alternation of unstressed and stressed syllables. Shakespeare, so it was beautiful, Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? There's an alternation between unstressed, shall I compare thee to, and stressed. This was an invention in England. At the same time, the same thing was invented here. They didn't look at each other. They, 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 if they talked to each other, they, they spoke French. So they didn't know they invented the same thing, but they did. And why was that? Because they had the same rhythm. If we listen to the same poem now in French, it has a very different rhythm. Let's listen to this poem in beautiful French. Oserais-je vous comparer à un jour d'été Oserais-je vous comparer à un jour d'été Or let's listen to this. Of course, Shakespeare has been translated in many languages. Let's listen to it in Japanese. Again, what at least possibly you hear is there's no stress. It's not that every syllable is, it is a different kind of rhythm. Now you can say this is poetry. Okay, so poetry, poetry is still made of language. So obviously the rhythm of poetry is going to be influenced by the rhythm of language. But the same is true if we, for instance, look at rap music. Rap music is a fantastic experiment which the world has done for us. Because rap music obviously is an invention from the Anglo-Saxon world. It was born in the Anglo-Saxon world, it was born in English, and then it moved the world over. And now French rappers are rapping in French. I always wanted to do this on stage. <laughs> Japanese, uh, that I'm not going to do on stage. Japanese rappers rap in Japanese and they use their rhythm. Ordinary rap, English rap music is based on stress again. Every line in a rap has four or five stresses depending on the kind of flow the rapper is in. French rappers don't do that. Japanese rappers don't do that. They use the rhythm of their own language. As a matter of fact, French rappers would not be able to do it. We know that French people tend to be what we call stress deaf. If you listen to a French person speaking some foreign, like English, one of the properties of French accent is putting the stress wrong, saying English. The reason for that is that they cannot do it right. The reason for that is that they don't hear where the stress is because they're not used to listening to the stress. Rap music, you can say, is still based on language. Language still plays an important role. So we can set one step even further than this. Why not move now to instrumental music? Music which was written by composers who never had any words in mind, just wrote music. Now, musicologists have found that there are actually differences between composers of different native languages. So we take two composers who worked in the same period, who worked in a similar style, who so worked in the same kind of school, but who had different languages, Statistically, we find 
a difference. Statistically, we find that the composer, coming from a Morse code background, writes a more kind of Morse code music, has more kinds of syncope, as musicians call it. Ta 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 ta. Whereas somebody coming from a machine gun background has more staccato. Ta 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 ta. ta. It's only a statistical thing, so it's difficult to hear from individual pieces. But fortunately, we have found some musicians to at least do this experiment now with us. Can you hear who is the Morse code composer and who is the machine gun composer? We're going to play two pieces by Mussorgsky, a Russian composer. Russian is very clearly a Morse code language. And César Franck, a speaker of French, which is very much a machine gun language. I present to you our musicians. So they're going to play Mussorgsky first, and we're expecting now to hear syncope, to, ex to hear Morse code. I'm going to point it out to you. So it the, the, these small notes don't matter, right? So it can be ta ta or ta 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 ta. ta. What matters is we come back every time at these stresses. Ta, 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 ta. You hear Russian, right? Okay, now we move to French. Now we move to a real machine gun composer, César Franck, the machine gun composer of the 20th century. Ta, 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 ta. It's kind of a slow machine gun. Ta, 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 ta. Fantastic. Now, you have to be aware, yes, yes, yes. You have to be aware, on the one hand, these guys are Dutch, so their feeling for French rhythm might not be perfect. Nor is mine, nor is mine. Huh? And, but at the same time, of course, we chose these examples, right? So it's not the case that if you're now uh, an English composer or a Russian composer, you can never write staccato music. It's in, in reality, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's more like a statistical finding we have. But that finding is still amazing, I find. It means that indeed, this rhythm is so deeply entrenched in our body. It's this thing we learned when, before we were born. So deeply entrenched that whenever we engage in any kind of rhythmic activity, we are lured, at least in that direction. And I believe it's something which we don't, typically don't realize when we learn a foreign language, that we also have to learn a different kind of rhythm. But that might be one of the important reasons why it's almost impossible to speak a foreign language fluently. Thank you.